And we'll prepare ourselves in our usual fashion by having a few moments of silent prayer. The option of rebound if necessary. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of your grace where you answer prayer and you continue to awe us in all that you do and are going to do. We live in a mad, mad world and yet we can have security, stability, all the things that we need and look for just by having a closer relationship with you. We thank you for this time that we can feed upon your word and pray that you will enlighten us so that we can be good and faithful servants. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, Paul. How you doing? Paul Parton's back there. Hadn't seen him in a while. Good to see you. Sight for sore eyes. Okay, we're going to continue in our study of the 21 tough questions about grace. And last time we went into the scripture that is in the start of this section. I'll put it on the board for you. And this was what this particular part of the book is about. It's by Andy Woods, who is pastor of Sugarland Bible Church, a friend of mine. Doesn't 2 Corinthians 13.5 say we need to examine ourselves to see if we are saved. A lot of people think that from getting this verse. Now here is the verse. 2 Corinthians 13.5 Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourself? Yourselves. I think I, I forgot. I thought I, I think I corrected that, but what, I, it didn't take what something here. There we go. Or do you not realize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you failed the test? And we went into the three different types of theology that have it wrong, they think that we are commanded. And this is a command, by the way, where it says, examine yourselves. That's a present active imperative. And Reformed theology, we gave you that. Lordship salvation and hyper-Calvinism. I'm not going to stop and go over those again, but you need to know what those are because those are the three major theologies that are going to say that Indeed, this verse is telling us that we need to periodically check ourselves to see if we are truly saved or not. And I told you before, uh, that really is doesn't have anything to do with eternal salvation. You see, here's where we're starting tonight, lesson 15. This is the last paragraph from, I guess that was last Thursday. It was, it was, compromising, um, excuse me, it was uh, preparing us for what's, what we start tonight. It says, comprehending these phases is necessary to properly interpret 2 Corinthians 13, 5, as will be demonstrated in this chapter. He's talking about the one that we're going to go over tonight. It starts here in lesson 15. Paul here is establishing a test for progressive Sanctification. Y'all all should be familiar with that term. Sanctification is in time what happens after we are saved. Now there is a positional sanctification where we are set apart for special blessings. But that has, happens in, a, in an instant when we believe the gospel and God is the one that accomplishes that in total. But there is another sanctification that this writer is talking about that is progressive sanctification because 
Positional sanctification happens in a second. It's an imputation. You don't feel it. You don't even know that it occurred until you start growing up in in the Word and you see that this is one of the things that happened. And the reason it's progressive is because it starts at the point of salvation and then it should, in a believer's life, progress all the way to the time that he dies. And positional sanctification, all that is necessary to be positional sanctified is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a done deal. But to be experientially sanctified, that is set apart to God in time, which is what we are in, is progressive. We start as uh, napios, remember the two babies? Or brephos, those are two Greek terms for babies. We all start out as babies, but then we should progress until we are in the intermediate stage of growth. Hopefully we get to the mature stage of growth, which is called teleos or huios. The word huios is, is translated son, and it's, it's, it's only for mature son. So, Paul here is establishing a test from this verse for progressive sanctification rather than for determining past justification. It's normative for people, especially theologians and many pastors, use the term justification referring to initial salvation. When you, when you believe the gospel, somebody says, that you were justified so-and-so because that is the point in time where God pronounces you justified. How can he pronounce us as fallen creatures with an old sin nature justified? What did he do in order to be able to say we are justified in his sight? He has imputed his own righteousness to us. And that happens at the moment of salvation. And when he sees his own righteousness in us, he pronounces us justified. This is one of the 40 things or more things that happen the moment that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But just remember, usually people use the word justified when it's referring to initial salvation and sanctified for a believer's growth after salvation. But like I said, technically there are two. There's a justification that is positional and a sanctification that is positional, but most people don't use those terms even though that is a fact. They usually don't go that deep. So what he's saying here is that this test that Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 13, 5 is a test for progressive sanctification while we are being sanctified when we are in time post salvation it is for believers to take this test it has nothing to do with being justified at the point of salvation it has nothing to do with eternal salvation then he says let us now examine nine reasons supporting this contention so he made his case and I made a case to some degree last time when I said held this book up, it's in our library, can you tell? Because most people think you can tell whether a person is saved or not by their behavior. The subtitle to this book is Can You Tell If People Are Saved By How They Live or By Their Behavior? And the answer is absolutely not. And yet that's the way the masses try to determine if a person is saved or not is by their behavior. And you cannot do it. Because there are Believers who live their life in a way that would embarrass hell, and there are unbelievers who have a sterling uh, life in the sense of they are courteous, they have integrity, uh, they have everything that you would think would be necessary to go to heaven, and yet they have rejected the gospel. <clears throat> all right, all that does is set us up for. Point number one, he says there's nine of them, nine points, nine reasons for supporting this contention that that verse has nothing to do with salvation. 
It really has nothing to do with whether you're saved or not. It has everything to do with how you're living your life. Are you being experientially sanctified? Or are you being carnal? Maybe falling into reversionism. So here we go with lesson 15. The Corinthians assumed believing status. Now he's, he's, he's writing to the Corinthians and he's saying they assumed believing status. That, another way of saying that is they saw themselves as believers. And now he's going to comment on that. First, throughout the Corinthian letters, both 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Paul assumes or presupposes the saved or being or believing status of the Corinthian church he is addressing. So Paul assumes or presupposes, he just takes it for granted, that the Corinthians are the saved or they have a believing status. They're believers of the Christian church he is addressing. So he takes it for granted that they are believers. Since this is the case, why would Paul, at the end of these letters, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, suddenly switch horses in midstream and challenge his readers to test themselves to see if they are really Christians at all? That wouldn't make sense, would it? He assumes throughout the whole epistle they are Christians. And then right at the end, he's going to say, okay, now wait a minute, y'all all need to take a test to see if you're really Christians. That just doesn't harmonize, does it? Such an abrupt and awkward conclusion would be out of harmony with the overall tune, tone and tenor of these letters. Notice a few verses from the Corinthian letters showing Paul believed that the Corinthians were regenerate. Now, one reason people would think that maybe they weren't really regenerate, maybe they weren't really Christians, is because they lived... Uh, a life that you could never tell by their behavior. Some of them were very legalistic. Some of them were hellions. The, they were <coughs> antinomian and everything in between. Right off the bat, Paul talks about them having a big argument, a big contention about who's, who baptized whom. They were arguing over that. How silly is that? <coughs> So people could look at the overall tenor of this epistle and by their behavior would say, oh no, uh, these people did everything wrong. So they couldn't be believers. But these are some verses that will demonstrate that the Bible says they absolutely were. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. This is the second verse in the first epistle. To the church of God that is in Corinth, <clears throat> Would he write that to unbelievers? Would he say that? To those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now you tell me, what kind of sanctification is that? Is that positional or is that experiential? Positional, right? Yeah. And that that is never, ever directed towards unbelievers. Only believers are sanctified especially positionally. And if you are sanctified positionally, you have to be a believer. So to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who live in every place, who call upon the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, both in both... Something is missing here. Oh, okay. Okay. The Lord and ours. So, isn't that, isn't that last part really great? This epistle is written to us as well. To all those, to, to, all, to, to the saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do that. So this epistle is pertinent to us as well. 1 Corinthians 3.1 And I... Brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Do you call unbelievers babes in Christ? No. By the way, that 1 Corinthians 3.1 is 
It starts out like that, and Paul is chewing them out. They should be teaching, and then they didn't know the elementary principles of being a believer. Four verses later, 1 Corinthians 3, 5. What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believe. You believe. There you go, believers. Even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. Second time he's saying they were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So not only were they sanctified, they were justified, and that never happens to unbelievers unless they believe the gospel. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Do unbelievers have the Holy Spirit as the temple? No. Who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. And then a couple more. Second, that was all 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. To the church of God that is in Corinth with all saints who are in the whole of Achaia. So he's talking, he's calling them again the church of God. By the way, we are also the church of God. This is just a building. We call it the church, but we are the church. Second Corinthians 1, 21 through 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us in God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. So unbelievers are not sealed. And they're not given the Spirit as a pledge. For in your faith you are standing firm. And here's a couple of them if you just want to jot these down because I thought it would be getting pretty redundant. But here's a couple of more to show that the Corinthians were truly believers. 2 Corinthians 3, 2 through 3, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, and 2 Corinthians 10, 15. These are all in 2 Corinthians. Here they are again. So I won't say 2 Corinthians this time. You have 3, chapter 3, 2, verse 2 through 3, chapter 6, 14 through 16, Chapter 8, verse 9, and chapter 10, verse 15 is more proof that Paul is talking to believers. Now, you see here, you notice that, see this, well, this is all, uh, you see this text here? This is um, bigger, and it's a different text than what I have starting right here. This is, what is this, uh, Times, Times Roman, what is it, something like that? Any, any, yeah, when, when I start to speak something that I'm going to say, it changes the font, and it's, uh, it's Times Roman, so that you will know that's not part of this, okay? And I also have it indented. So now this is not what the book says. These are some comments that I wanted to make. The fact that the Corinthians assumed a believer's status brings up two interesting questions. Number one, how can a person know if he is a believer? Now, this is a pretty simple question, isn't it? I mean, everyone should be able to answer that question. And yet most, most believers, most people who go to church and profess being Christians, if you ask them that question, they hesitate. They're in a predicament. They have no way of expressing how they know that they are a believer. What do you suppose most of them are going to go to to prove that they're a believer? I want to hear one word, and it's plural. Works. That's where they go. And when they go there, it's pretty good proof that they're not believers. Now, they may be confused. Maybe they are, and they never got any training to understand really what the gospel is about. So, 
How can a person know if he is a believer? I'll give you just a minute. Let's just be quiet for just at least one minute. And I want you to formulate in your own mind, if someone asks you, are you a believer? And you said yes. And they said, how do you know? What would you say? All right, the time's clicking. I'll give you a little time. Thirty seconds is a long time, isn't it? Okay, I'm, I'm not going to give you a minute. I'm going to give you thirty seconds. Get five, four. Okay. Hopefully, it wouldn't take you that long. But here is what I have. Here we are. Here. How can a person know if he is a believer? Put it up a little higher. We have already established that it cannot be assessed. It, can, it cannot be assessed, should be a by and there, by behavior. Works have nothing to do with receiving the free gift of eternal life, so how can we know for sure that we are saved? Of course, we learn from scriptures that we are saved the moment that we put our faith alone in Christ alone. We are saved by grace through faith. It is not a process. It's something that is instantaneous before, because the moment that we take our faith and we connect it with Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, and that moment we are born again and we are saved, eternally saved. Here's a scripture. It just, it, there's several, uh, several I could give you. This is, this is one I like the best. John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Everlasting life is the same as eternal life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. What is so, one reason I like this verse so much is because it's so simple. If you believe in the Son, if the object of your faith for your eternal destiny is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, then you have at that point eternal life, everlasting life. And then it has a contrast on the other side. But he who does not, he who is not baptized shall not see life. Doesn't say that? Oh, oh, excuse me. Those who don't go to church, no? Oh, let's see. Those who volunteer. We could go on and on, couldn't we? What does it say? And he who does not believe. They don't believe the Son. They're trusting in their own works. They shall not see life. They will never have eternal life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Do you see how powerful that is and how simple? So, <clears throat> How do we know that we have eternal life? Because the Bible says if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have eternal life, period. And, and, and there's over 100 verses that attest to that. Some allege that we can't know for sure if we believe something or not. And I say that is nonsense. Every rational person knows what he believes and what he does not believe. At any given time, if somebody says, well, let me ask you this. Somebody might come up to you and say, do you believe that Trump is going to be impeached? Now, you have an idea about that, but let me, let me get something that's a little, uh, a little more clear. Let's say that... Um, I, I, I got to get out of that because that's too political. I don't want to be political. Uh, <laughs> this is where my mind went right then. Uh, anytime someone asks you something, and they might say, well, to the question I just asked, probably most of you, if not all of you, would say, I don't know. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But if they ask you, um, is... Let's say your brother is standing there or your sister, and they say, is this your brother? Do you have to think about that? 
do you, do, how do you know that's your brother? Maybe you're the younger brother and he was born before you and you're just taking everybody's word that he was in your family. But you believe that he's your brother. You see what I'm saying? You, what I'm trying to say is on any given subject matter, you have opinions on things, which means you believe certain things. Since no one can make an assessment on the basis of their behavior, we must determine what he is, whether he is saved by what he says he believes. In other words, we determine if a person is saved or not by what they say. The first part of this, uh, I think I, I skipped a little part here. Let me go back. Some allege we can't know for sure if we believe something or not. That is nonsense. Every rational person knows that he, what he believes and what he does not believe. Now, we're stopping there because we are looking at, at for ourselves. If someone said, are you a believer? Are you a Christian? Are you saved? And you, you say, yes, I'm saved, and they ask you why. Because the Bible says if I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and the work on the cross, that he did for me, then I'm saved. And they say, well, how can you know that you believe that? Well, that's like saying, how, do, how can I know anything? I mean, there are certain things that you know. Is that correct? Now, this point two, we're not talking about how you can prove that or how you believe or why you believe that you're a believer. Now we're saying, how can you know someone else is a believer? Y'all see the transition here? Okay. How can we know if someone is a Christian? Since no one can make that assessment on the base of their behavior, we must determine whether he is saved by what he says he believes. So when we're talking to a, a person and we are trying to get to know him, maybe we're witnessing or just getting to know somebody, and we say, uh, are you a believer? And he says, no. You can pretty well take for granted he's not a believer. It's not 100% sure. Maybe it's, it was a believer. Or, um, let me put it. Maybe it is a believer who had believed the gospel and got off course, and now he's into deep reversionism, and he doesn't like the Lord. Maybe he's uh, part of Herod Rishni or something else. He's a believer and doesn't know it, but he says he believes he's not a believer. But for the most part, somebody says, no, I'm not a believer. You can, you can believe him, right? You take that for granted. Okay. If one says that he is a Christian because he believes in Jesus Christ, he may or might, may not be saved. Now, don't start throwing rocks yet. If a person, if a person says, yes, I'm a believer, you just ask them, are you a Christian, are you a believer? And they say yes. And I'm saying maybe he's saved and maybe he isn't. Look at this. Most people in America, 71% identify as Christians. 25% of that figure is evangelical, 20% is Catholic, and 26% is Protestant, mainline denomination. That's how this kind of breaks, breaks down. And that's right, breaking down for sure. Most of those who profess to be Christians are not. Out of that 71%, well, look at this. 20% are Catholic. Only 20, 25% evang evangelical, and that far a long shot is not a correct figure. If they're just taking every evangelical as a believer, that's way high. And then 26% of Protestant, you know, that would be the... I'm not sure. Then I, I don't think it's counting the, what we would call cults in there. But my point is, out of all those people, how many are truly saved? Well, are, out of that 20% of Catholics, what would you guess how many are saved? There are some saved Catholics. Maybe 1%? How about those who are Protestant? Mainline denominational. The, you have the, uh, what's the, uh, 
you know, with the Baptist, Methodist, um, Presbyterian. Presbyterian, Episcopal, all those. Uh, yeah, and a lot of them have uh, openly gay men and lesbians they call pastors and so forth. So anyway, my point is when someone says they are a believer, maybe they are and maybe they're not, but you don't ever take that for granted. Look at what, I say, what I'm saying here. Most of those who profess to be Christians are not. They believe that works must be added to faith in order to be saved. And that's why they're not saved. That's, when, that's why when we ask a person if they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and they say yes, we must also ask them if that is all that is necessary to find out. That's, that's the question that, you, that you're going to get an answer to where you're going to find out if they really are saved or not, or it appears that they are. We must also ask them if, if that is all that's necessary. If they had anything to faith alone in Christ alone, you have reason to doubt their salvation. Now, it doesn't mean that they automatically are an unbeliever. They could be a believer that is confused. But I would not take that for granted. I would have, that would be very doubtful in my mind if someone says that they are a believer and then you ask them, is that all you have to do is believe? And they say, oh, no. And then they give you a litany of baptism, being good, the tithing, and a whole bunch of other things. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because we're looking at the people in Corinth and they were assumed to be believers. I don't know what percent of them were, maybe, maybe close to 100%. But for our time, when you ask someone, are they a believer, how are you able to distinguish where they are or not? Behavior is off, off limits because it doesn't have anything to do with the subject. And works, I don't care how works, how many works, how sweet and nice and good and all that, that's off the table also. The only way we can try to determine if a person, another person is saved or not is by what they tell us. And when they say that they believe in Jesus Christ, how many believers have gone to, uh, to give the gospel to people and they say, uh, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? And they say, yes, I do. And they say, well, hallelujah, brother. I'm so glad that we're kin. And this person is no more saved than uh, Osama bin Laden. Now, of course, Osama bin Laden, people say, oh, he's a monster. He's going to hell. And why do they say that? Because of his behavior. There's probably some of those people over there that are believers. We know that there's some. So if they add anything to faith alone in Christ alone, you have reason to doubt their salvation. If they say... Faith alone in Christ is all that is necessary, then we should consider them to be a believer. Why? Why would anyone lie about that? Who's going to make that up? So what I'm telling you and what we, we see here, and I, the reason I'm taking this, this much time is because we this should be fundamental. We should be able to just crank this out like this. The reason that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt we're basing our eternal destiny on the fact that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid for our sins. And the Bible says, whenever you believe that, then in that moment, in that point of time, you have eternal life. That's what I am, that's what I am believing in order to secure my eternal destiny. And if anyone ever even if it's the St. Peter at the Golden Gates, ask me, uh, why should I go into heaven? i got one answer. Because I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing else. Bing. Any questions about any of that? Okay. Now that's the end of my little spiel. Now we're continuing with the book. Note Hodges... Appropriate comments on 2 Corinthians 13.5. And I don't know what Hodges this is. There's a Zane Hodges and there's another Hodges that's not so hot. But anyway. Uh, regrettably, these forceful words. Now he's talking about those in 2 Corinthians 13.5 where we are commanded to test ourselves, to evaluate ourselves, 
to see if we are in the faith. It's possible that we are not. That's what he's talking about. Now, regrettably, these forceful words have been sadly misconstrued. They have been read by some interpreters as though they were a challenge to the Corinthians to find out whether they were really saved or not. This is unthinkable. After 12 chapters in which Paul takes their Christianity for granted, can he only now be asking them to make sure they're born again? That the readers of this book examine 2 Corinthians on their own. They will see clearly how often the apostle affirms in one way or another his conviction that the readers are genuinely Christian. And if they're genuinely Christian, there is no reason ever to doubt their eternal destiny, their salvation. It is secure. And it, I'm tempted to ask you how, you how you would prove that, but we just went over that, uh, so you should, should still be fresh in your mind. Remember, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. He can't take them back. Eternal life is given as a what? A gift. God can take it back even if he wanted to, and he certainly doesn't want to. Okay, now we're moving on. This is the That was the first point. I know it was kind of long because I had my little say in there, but we're moving on to the second point that you don't test yourself to see if you are truly saved. Proving oneself applies to believers. This, that's part of his notes here. This is the second one. The notion of testing, examining, or proving oneself is an idea that applies to an authentic believer whose salvation is not in doubt. So we do need to be tested or test ourselves. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, quote, test yourselves. The word translated test in the ESV, English Standard Version, examine in the New American Standard Bible, or prove in the King James Version, is the Greek verb dokimazo. That's spelled D-O-K-I-M-A-Z-O. That's a verb. It's the, the, ag the adjectival form of the word is dokimos which can be applicable to a genuine believer. In fact, Paul applies this very word to Timothy. Now, doki manzo is the verb to test yourself. And doki mas just means a test, a, a, an examination. So Paul applied this very word to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And this is a very important word. I don't like this translation. Uh, I like the King James Version. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the way I understood it. And it says, do your best. Some says, be diligent. The Greek word there is spudazo. And the King James Version says study. And I think the reason I like that, because if you are diligent, if you have spidonzo, then you're going to study. And it actually says, study to show yourself approved unto God. Now you can understand, see that word approved, I have it in red there? Why would we have to prove ourselves to God, be approved, when we're already saved. There are those who think it refers to prove that we are still saved. What are we doing in order to convince ourselves that we're still eternally saved? A lot of people take it that way, but it's completely out of context. <clears throat> the word translated approved, which I have right here, Approved. Here is the Greek adjective dokimos. Timothy was obviously a true believer. Here you have Timothy. You have Paul telling Timothy, you need to study in order to show yourself approved unto God. Now, was Timothy, who 
was the spiritual son of Paul who's going to take over the church. Does it make sense that he would be an unbeliever? Of course not. This is a believer. So the word translated proof here in the Greek adjective dokimos, Timothy was obviously a true believer. In fact, Timothy was Paul's son in the faith. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. Paul would not have installed Timothy as the pastor at Ephesus if the apostle had any lingering doubts about Timothy's salvation. We're all convinced that Timothy was a believer. And yet, Paul wrote to him and said, Study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This was not to an unbeliever. This was, of course, to a believer. Interestingly, Paul even applies this very word, dokimos, to himself. Just two verses following the, his exhortation to the Corinthians to examine themselves. We were looking at 2 Corinthians 13.5. 2 Corinthians 13.7 says, Not that we may appear to have met the test. In other words, he's saying that they're not taking it for granted that they passed the test. And look at the word we. That is including Paul himself. And Paul was a believer, of course. It's the same word, dokimos, approved. Paul himself was obviously an authentic believer, yet he had no problem applying an adjectival form of dokimonzo to himself, just as he also applied it to his protege, Timothy. Wilkin, this would be Bob Wilkin, he's the mover and shaker of the uh, grace, what is that called? Uh, something about grace. Wilkin explains how the notion of approval conveyed through dokimonzo and dokimos is a concept that is applicable to a true believer, whether you're approved or not. Now, this is very important. I, this really makes you think, and I think it's a good point right here. This is what Bob Wilkin is doing. Grace Evangelical Society, that's who he's head of. Now, look at this. I have it underlined. This is what Bob Wilkin is saying. Acceptance and approval are two different things. They are not the same. It's easy for us to think they are, but they're not. Acceptance and approval are two different things. And here he explains. God accepts all believers solely on the basis of their faith in Christ. Approval requires more than faith. So all believers are accepted by Christ based on the work of the cross. Every believer is accepted, but not every believer is approved. Being accepted, accepted to God in a positional sense means that you believe. And when you believe, then you are accepted by God. But approval requires more than faith. It takes works. It is conditioned upon spiritual maturity and is not an once and for all event. When you believe the gospel, it is a once and for all event. It's just like when you were born physically, it was a once and all event. When you, believe, when you are born spiritually, it is a once-in-a-lifetime event. But approval is something altogether different. It's progressive. It takes work. So a believer who is approved today is not guaranteed approval this time next year. Remaining in a state of Christ's approval is contingent upon continuing to confess Christ in word and deed. We call that being experientially sanctified. We're growing, baby believer, teenage believer, mature believer. We should be progressing through that. Some people never get out of babyhood. 
spiritually. So a believer who is approved today is not guaranteed approval this time next year. He will always be accepted, but he may not always be approved. Remaining in a state of Christ's approval is contingent upon continuing to confess Christ in word and deed. We have ten minutes. Y'all need a little seventh inning stretch or y'all good to go? Good to go? Okay. Now this is the third idea. Disqualification applies to believers. So believers can be approved. They're already accepted. See, this is a hard one for people to think. What do you mean? Disqual- Believers can be disqualified from what? You know what jumps in the mind of the average person if you ask that question? A believer can be disqualified for what? Or from what? And they would say from heaven. That's all they think. They don't know anything about experiential after salvation. As far as they know, I'm saved, and now all this life that I have to live, well, I'm going to live by the Ten Commandments. That's, that's all they know. And they hope that they can fulfill the Ten Commandments, which nobody can, and they don't even know half of them anyway. That's the way people live. That's, a, that's not the way to live. All right, here's the third idea. The idea of disqualification is applicable to authentic, authentic believers whose salvation is not in doubt. The last clause in 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Unless, indeed, you fail to meet the test. These are believers who fail the test. If the test is eternal salvation, who's going to get into heaven? Nobody. The word translated, uh, that's twice in there, and that's not my mistake, by the way. The word translated, see, I've got it twice. That other one, I didn't do either. I, it it was, came across that way. But so be it. The word translated, fail to meet the test in the English Standard Version or disqualified in the New King James Version is the Greek adjective, adokimos. Does dokimos sound familiar? It means to be tested. Adokimos, that's a... Uh, alpha negative, they put an A in front of it in the Greek to say you failed the test. You didn't meet the test. This word is used two other times in the immediate context of 2 Corinthians 13, 6 and 7. So not only is it used in the verse that we're looking at, we're focusing on, the next two verses it comes into play as well. A dokimas means to fail the test, not meet the mark or reach the mark. So here is 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6 and 7. One, the two verses right after the one that we're looking at. But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Who is that talking about? Paul and his followers, his pastoral candidates that's following him around to see how to be a a pastor. He says, I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Then he says, verse 7, Now we pray to God that you do no wrong, not that we ourselves may appear approved. I didn't highlight that, and I should have done read there. That's the... That's dokimos. But that you may do what is right, even though we should appear adokimos, unapproved. Paul is talking about there was a possibility, in fact, not only a possibility, there were those who said that Paul didn't meet the test. They weren't following him, Paul. They thought he was uh, uh, something that he said he was not. So, We ourselves, the reason that he says we, verse verse 6, 
I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do meet the test. He said that in order to counter those who said he didn't meet the test. They were accusing him of that. And he's saying, now we pray to God that you do no wrong. That is our main concern. Not that we ourselves may be, may appear approved. They were saying, he's saying, I'm not telling you this in order that you may think that we are approved. We are approved. We, we passed the test. But we're saying this, uh, and not that ourselves may be approved, but that you may do what is right. That's the whole thing. See up here? It says that you do no wrong right here. And then you get down here. It says uh, that you may do what is right. That's what they're trying to, to get at. He says, even though we should appear unapproved. He's saying, we are approved. There are those of you who say we're not. The reason that we're saying that we are approved and, and, and addressing this is so that you may do what is right, that you will do no wrong. That is our purpose. Even though, the last part, we should appear unapproved. The point here is that Paul is using this word to refer to him and those others that were following in him. We're talking about the big cheese apostle. And he uses the word that could apply to him, which is adokimos unapproved. So even the Apostle Paul could have been unapproved. Here, Paul applies the word to himself as he explains that he had not failed the test, verse 6, despite the fact that the Corinthians thought he had, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 9.27 is the only other place where Paul uses the same word in the Corinthian letters. And here it is. You see it right here in, in bold. But I discipline, my, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I should, that I myself should be adokimos, disqualified. So if Paul could be disqualified, adokimos, not pass the test, then surely any other believer could be in that same category of not passing the test. This proves that believers don't always pass the test. It has nothing to do with unbelievers. They're not even in the ball game. They don't even know where the stadium is. But believers are the ones that can fail the test. And the test is how are you living your life, not whether you're saved again. Paul again applies this very uh, 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 adjective to himself. What did Paul fear that might disqualify him? He never doubted the genuineness of his salvation. In First Timothy, excuse me, in Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he explained, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. And we are the same. We know if we believed or not. Now, many of you, maybe even most of you, know the day. You can give the date of when you were born again. Well, that's fine. But you don't have to. I don't have a clue when I was saved. Because I was in the Baptist church and I walked the aisle to wore a carpet. I had to replace the carpet. But it doesn't matter. I don't have to know when I was saved. I know now, and I've known for a long time, that I'm saved because I know that I put my faith alone in Christ alone. And that's it. That's the ball game. And that's all I have to say for tonight. Any questions? Well, what this does, and the fact, see, the second one is proving oneself applies to the, uh, to the believers. No, that's not the one I want, the third one. The third one, we just, here it is. Disqualification applies to believers. Even though our eternal destiny is secure because we believed in Christ, whether we are going to grow to maturity whether we're going to have rewards, decorations, privileges, and opportunities for all eternity is determined by whether we've 
pass or fail the test in experientially glorifying Christ through our body and through our deeds. Well, he was when he was talking about he buffeted his body and did all these things. It was just an illustration how he it, it takes work, it takes self control, it takes a lot of things in order to be experientially sanctified. In order to pass the test, it's not just like a one you go and take one test and you got it. And you, just for instance, I went and took a plumber's uh, license test when I was, I guess I was around 21, 22. I took it one time. And as long as I continued to pay the fee to keep that license going, it was a one-time deal. That was it. But if we're going to pass the test, the test lasts from the time that we are born again to the time we check out. That's the test. And as we go, the Bible is saying, it might be a good idea to kind of check where you are on that spectrum. And we had a, a great lesson, uh, not this past Sunday, but the Sunday before by Greg, Greg Kreitzer, who laid it all out where you can check. Where, where are you spiritually? Go to major Bible events. It's, uh, do you all remember the lesson number that is right after? It's the one right before we had Sunday. 138. Okay, it's right after 138, right? It 138. Okay, I don't, well, I didn't get a lesson. Well, I think it's 137, then we went to 138. Just go there. It's, it's several pages, 10, 11 pages. When you read that, and you can check, he says, if you are a baby believer, this is the way you're going to be. If you are an adolescent believer, this is the things that you can see whether you apply or not. If you're a mature believer, wow, these are the things you have to comply with. And so you can see where you are. And this is a great time to do it because it's the new year. Might as well start out getting the good news out of the bad news so that you can persevere. Okay, well. That was the 29th, by the way. What? That was the 29th. 29th. 29th what? December. That was that. Great. Oh, okay. I thought you, I thought I was still on lesson numbers. You didn't give me 29. I thought, wait. <laughs> okay, December the 29th. Okay, let's close. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we have the opportunity to be here to put things together so that we can think in a sophisticated way, so that we can know where we are on the spiritual spectrum, so that we can see that we all have room to grow, a lot of room to grow. And it will challenge us to fulfill our mission when we see where we are. And we are so thankful that never, ever does any believer ever have to go back when he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and try to wonder if it's enough faith, the right kind of faith. It simply does not apply to that whatsoever. Because of your grace and your love and because of the cross, that is a done deal. So we pray that you will help us do introspection. It's so easy to judge other people. But the Bible says we are to judge ourselves. We are to test ourselves. Are we in the faith? And we'll get to that part next time. So help us to take our spiritual life seriously and that our reputation, our, our Time with you will be enhanced because of the relationship getting stronger. And we do that. That automatically happens as we stay in the Word. So challenge us with these things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.